Today, um, Kathy will be preaching for us about um, starting in Luke 2, 8 through 14. So I'll read it for you. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in, a, in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Good morning, Second Baptist. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. So, uh, it looks like winter is upon us. Maybe not by the calendar, but we've got some snow outside. I don't know if that makes you happy or not happy. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, it's pretty low at from in here where it's nice and warm. And, uh, you know, I told the first service, you really kind of have to be happy either way. If you like snow, you're happy. If you don't like snow, well, you know, we did wait until mid-December to get snow. So um, we can't really complain, I think, right? Um, so, so the snow is here, winter's here, and Christmas is almost here. And I don't know if you're uh, if you're like me, but I feel like I'm never quite ready for it. It just it seems to to kind of all of a sudden come. And um, you know, if you've ever been getting ready for for something, if you're if you're gone, you know, you go out or you get ready for something, and you just have a, a lot of time. And then, and you look at the clock, like, oh, I got plenty of time, I got too much time, and then all of a sudden you're late for the, for the event because you took that window, and um, and and then you're you're late. I see a husband like nudging his wife over there. Um, I, that's me. And and you know sometimes if I get too much time, then it's like, oh, all right, then I go slowly, and now I'm late. And that's me with Christmas too. I feel like you know I saw a decorations book before Thanksgiving this year. And I'm like, wow, that's really early. And then right after, I'm like, yes, that's spot on. That's but you know, there's plenty of time, plenty of time. Well, it's December 10th, and I don't have a single decoration up in my house. And Christmas is two weeks away, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's, it's here, it's here, and um, I'm not quite ready, but um, but nevertheless, two weeks away, you know, it's Christmas Eve, and so oh, I'm sure the kids are excited. And what's on the Christmas wish list this year? I don't know, I'm totally out of the loop when it comes to the, to the kids and the hot items and, and all that. If there's somebody that wants to fill me in, go ahead. I don't know what it is this year. Um, but what is, what's on the list? What's on our wish list? And, I mean, you can go ahead and yell them out if you want, if you want to share. Um, but at the same time, um, what is... What is always that thing that's on the list that's not always um, around Christmas time, but what is it that people wish for commonly, both at Christmas and just generally, if you were to say, hey, if you could have anything, anything you wanted with no limitations, what is it that you would want? What are some of the things? Okay, peace on earth. Did I hear one other? Rest. Rest. Um, and peace on earth. I heard world peace, peace on earth. Cure for cancer, serenity, um, health and happiness. Those things that we don't always find under the tree, right? Um, but the ones that, that I heard kind of first, I just, right, right in this section over here, peace, peace on earth, world peace. Um, and that's a common wish for people. World peace. Peace on earth. We want peace. And so I want you to keep that desire for peace in mind as we go throughout the sermon today. Um, and we'll come back to it. But let's look at our scripture. Barbara, if you can put up, up starting in verse 10. <coughs> Here we have, in, in the book of Luke, we have this record of um, an announcement about Jesus' birth. The shepherds are in the field. They're, they're watching the sheep, as shepherds do. And um, I can only try to imagine the scene. Because they're there, and all of a sudden an angel appears, which has to be a pretty remarkable Event. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you great, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. 
And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloth and lying in a manger. Okay, so, so this angel has made this announcement that what you're waiting for has happened. The Savior has come. The Savior has been born. And then, again, I can only imagine, try to imagine, what the scene would have looked like um, because it, the, the word tells us that this whole multitude of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel. And they were praising God. And I can only imagine what it is to, to see a, a, a whole host of angels praising God. Um, it must be very remarkable and awe-inspiring. And they're praising God, and they're saying, um, go ahead on to verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So, um, what is this that the angels are proclaiming? They're saying, on earth peace. Now, why did the angels, I, I think that they're, when the multitude appeared, it seems like it's uh, maybe both a proclamation but also a celebration. You know, they're praising God and they're saying, and this is what they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. Now, why did they, why did they celebrate and proclaim peace? Why didn't they say on earth hope? Why didn't they say on earth love or joy or even on earth salvation? They came and they said, on earth peace. And, and who is it um, that receives this peace? So, so first let's look at what is the peace that they're proclaiming? Was it the absence of war and conflict? Was it simply um, that kind of nice holiday spirit that we feel around this time of year when people are a little nicer to each other and you know, hold the door for each other and that kind of thing at the shopping mall when they might not normally? Is it just peace on earth, that sort of like holiday spirit feeling? I think it was more than that. And if you look at uh, the biblical word for peace that's used both in the Hebrew and the Greek, um, a couple different Bible dictionaries give definitions, and it says it's a state of wholeness and security embracing both the physical and spiritual dimensions. So it's a state of wholeness. If you're familiar with the, um, the greeting shalom, so shalom is the Hebrew word for peace, and, and sometimes that's, that's proclaimed as a, as a greeting, shalom. It doesn't just mean, um, it, it means almost like a, like a be well, be whole. Uh, it's, it's more than just like how are you that we, that we say. Um, another, another dictionary says that it comes from the word to join, tie together into a whole. So properly it's wholeness, as in uh, when all essential parts are joined together. God's gift of wholeness. So this idea of peace that they're proclaiming is not simply a, a lack of conflict, a lack of war, um, but it is an idea that um, encompasses wholeness. And I would submit to you today that world peace, that, that idea that we just said people want, is possible. And it's possible in our lifetime. Well, I'll explain that um, a little later. So, so who is the recipient of this peace? Those with whom he is pleased. So in researching peace in the Bible, um, there's really a, there's an association between peace and righteousness and following God's law and commandments. So, so you've got peace and righteousness going hand in hand. In Psalm 85.10, it says, Steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Psalm 119.165, Great peace have those who love your law. And then Isaiah 32, 17. And the effect of righteousness will be peace. So there's this association in scripture between righteousness and peace. And that presents a challenge for me um, because I have a righteousness problem. Anybody else? So if righteousness is required um, to get God's favor, sometimes if you see different translations of this particular verse, you may have heard, um, like the Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown version, um, on earth peace, goodwill toward men, you heard that one probably, on earth peace uh, to those on whom his favor rests, that's another version, and then the ESV says, um, with those, among those with whom he is pleased. So how, how do I know if God is pleased with me, if, if it requires righteousness? And in that case, I would say, well, then God's probably not pleased with me. Because I'm not righteous. Not in and of myself, anyway. I can't do enough good. I, I fall short all the time. And if righteousness is required, then I, I don't fit the bill, and I'm not among those that the angels would be proclaiming peace to. 
But that's not how it works. Um, in, in what God did in sending Jesus. So, so if it was up to me, and it was up to just me in and of myself, then yep, I have a righteousness problem. And I don't fit the bill. But Jesus was sent to solve that righteousness problem. So look at Colossians 1, 19 through 20. And it, this scripture will explain that Jesus became the righteousness that we need. In order to become righteous in God's eyes, he did that, he became that for us, so that we, through him, can also be viewed as righteous in God's eyes. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And then uh, at Ephesians 2, 2 through 18, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who, were one, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the divided wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. In other words, the, the, the requirement that you fulfill every law and every commandment, he's abolished that, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So, making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body to the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So, if our requirement to be righteous before God is to follow every law perfectly, we all fall short. But when Jesus comes, he takes care of that by fulfilling that requirement because he never fell short. And therefore, when we put our faith in him, we are then righteous before God. And so we fall under the blessing proclaimed by the angel that, that we would receive peace um, to all those on whom his favor rests. Because if we're righteous before God, then his favor rests on us. Simplifies it for us. Simplifies it greatly. So Jesus came to establish peace. I think first and foremost, Jesus came to establish peace between God and man. And I think that's why the angels proclaimed peace and didn't necessarily, um, didn't include that we have record of, you know, that, they, that he brought hope, that he brought joy, that he brought love. He brought all those things. But I think at the foundation was Jesus was coming to bring peace between God and man. Um, and he did that through his death on the cross, that we might become righteous before God, not because of what we do, but through our faith in what he did. So who are those with whom God is pleased? Those that are righteous in their faith. Take a look at Romans 5.1. Um, do we have this one? Oh, we do. Okay. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Kind of sums up what I was just saying. And then uh, Romans 8, 1 through 6. This is, a, this is an assuring, a reassuring verse for us who believe. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we can stop right there for just a moment. No condemnation. It's almost hard for us to wrap our heads around, isn't it? Because we feel the weight and the guilt of our sin, as we should, because I think the Holy Spirit convicts us, uh, because we should strive towards righteousness. And yet, sometimes that guilt is so heavy that, that we, we forget or we fail to really hold on to the fact that Jesus is our righteousness, not anything we do in and of ourselves, and we feel condemned. And we feel like God isn't pleased with us, or God maybe maybe doesn't have his favor on us, or maybe he even has abandoned us or doesn't love us because of what we've done. When it's impossible to please God by what we do, we can only please God by putting faith in what Jesus did. So there is therefore now no condemnation, none, for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Law of sin and death is the one that we are unable to follow perfectly. 
Verse 3, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So that righteous requirement is fulfilled in, in us through Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So Jesus came and he, he, first of all, he gave us peace with God, peace and, and reconciliation back into relationship with God. But not only did he bring the ability to have that peace with God, but he also brought the ability for us to experience peace on earth. Now remember I said keep in mind that desire um, of, of people to have peace. It's one that dates all the way back, I think, probably to the beginning, of, probably to the fall, um, where people desire peace. It's sort of an innate, an innate thing. Immediately when I said, what's the wish that people have? It was real peace, peace on earth. We want peace. So go back to that desire, and um, some, there's actually some traditions, some churches. Now in the first service, we have a time where we um, greet each other. And here, we just, you know, it's just a time of fellowship. We, we say, hi, good morning, how are you? you know, whatever small conversations take place. In some other traditions, they actually call that the passing of the peace. And so um, what they do there is often they will extend a hand and say, peace be with you, and the other person will say, also with you. Um, so several churches do that. Interestingly, my grandmother, when she first went to a church that did that, and she was unfamiliar with the, the custom, somebody said, peace be with you, and she said, oh, pleased to meet you too. <laughs> <laughs> so she wasn't... <laughs> Yeah, go grandma. Um, so, <laughs> anyhow, um, and even here, every week, every week we conclude our benediction with, come on, you know it, go, go in peace. peace. Peace, yes, every week, go in peace. We say it, right? Why do we say that? Why do we say go in peace? Why don't we say go in hope? Why don't we say go in joy? Why don't we say go in love? We could, but we say go in peace. And and the, um, the, that expression, go in peace, actually dates all the way back to Bible times. There are several, several places in scripture where the phrase, go in peace, is found. Now, interestingly, that phrase is often found in places where people were coming, um, coming out of difficult or dangerous situations or going into them. So when Moses was returning to Egypt after he had fled, many years after he had fled Egypt, he had fled because he had killed an Egyptian, um, he was going to return, God had called him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, and he was going to go back to Egypt to, to do that. He, um, he asked his father-in-law about going back, and his father-in-law said, go in peace. When Paul and Silas were jailed, and they were about to be released, the jailer said to them, go in peace. When Hannah was praying for a child, and Eli was in the temple and originally thought that she was intoxicated, um, and she explained, no, I'm praying, you know, she was barren, she was praying to have a child. He said to her, go in peace. When, um, when David and Jonathan parted ways, David and Jonathan were close friends, and Jonathan warned David, it's not safe to stay here anymore. His father Saul was going to kill David, and so Jonathan and David had a time together, and then Jonathan said to David, go in peace. Um, his life was in danger. And there was a sinful woman who anointed Jesus. And, and if you know the story, she came in. There was a dinner. Jesus was there. She came in. She poured um, this oil on, on him and anointed him. And uh, it, was, it was frowned upon by some. And Jesus said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And then there's another place that I want to look at. There's really two stories here. It's in Luke chapter 8. Um, and this is the story both of the woman with the issue of blood and of Jairus and his daughter. And now I have to tell you that Jairus and his daughter is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. And so I kind of wish that I could just preach on this, um, but I have to save some of it because it's, it's not all for this sermon. But, um, but we have here uh, the story of Jairus, and it sort of sandwiches the story of, of a woman who has a, a medical issue. And so we'll take a look. Um, in Luke chapter 8, and there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. 
Then falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Now can you imagine any worse situation than a child who's about to die? And so he comes and he pleads with Jesus, come, because my daughter is about to die. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. So we have two people in two very desperate situations. Both in need of peace, maybe both searching for peace. And they both come to Jesus. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And so you see, um, before we continue, that this woman, she came trembling to him. Now, she, I don't know what they would have done to her, but, but her, her condition rendered her what was called in the Old Testament unclean. So if she touched anybody, she would then make that person unclean. Anything that she sat on um, would be unclean, so, so if anybody else sat on it, they would be unclean. So it was this whole kind of system there. And, and so she took a great risk in touching not only another person, but a male and a rabbi, um, that, you know, that was a big risk. I don't know what they, they would have done had things not proceeded the way they do as we read about scripture, um, but I think at the very least she would have been the object of some pretty sharp um, condemnation. So she takes the risk, she touches him, and it's, and, and it's interesting, in, in one commentary I was reading, they made the point that instead of um, him becoming unclean, which was the, kind of what the custom and the law said, that if she touched him, he would be unclean. Jesus really reverses it, and, he's, and, and he makes her clean instead. And so, um, so she comes and she reports how she had immediately been healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And then we pick up with Jairus again. While he was still speaking, Someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And when all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And so, again, we have two people in two very desperate situations. Um, and Jairus, Jairus' daughter, um, I think one of the reasons this is one of my favorite stories is there's so much emotion in this. Sometimes you read scripture and you kind of just read through the words and you see the events, but to, to think of what Jairus was experiencing as he looked at his daughter, who was probably laying on a bed and knew that there were moments left, and he was going to search out and find the one thing that he thought might help. And he went to Jesus and pleaded with him, come, you know, my daughter is dying. And then it seems like things get interrupted to the point where maybe it's too late. And so, you know, Jesus agrees to come. They start walking, and here comes this woman. And she needs Jesus, too. And I wonder what Jairus was thinking. Was he getting anxious? You know, his daughter's dying. What first situation can you imagine? His daughter's dying, and he must have been thinking, you know, maybe there was a part of him that said, oh, she needs them too, but maybe there's a part that's gone. There's no time. we got to go. And it seems like it's too late. It, you know, it gets interrupted and they come and, and he hears the worst news a parent could hear. Your daughter's dead. It's too late. It's over. What do you mean? Don't bother anymore. 
And Jesus says to him what? Jesus says, do not be afraid. How do you not be afraid in a situation like that? How do you not be afraid in, in, these, in situations of turmoil, in situations where your heart is breaking? When you look at a loved one who's sick and, and maybe dying, when, when you look at uh, the, the possible loss of your job and you don't know how you're going to make ends meet, when you look at uh, strife in your family, when you look at these situations and you say, Don't have anxiety. What? How do I do that? And what Jesus says is, don't be afraid. Just believe. And she will be well. And the word there for well, be well, she will be well, Jairus' daughter, is the same one that he said that that is used when he said to the woman, um, go in faith. Uh, where is it? Let me see if I can grab it here. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So when he says, your, your, he tells Jairus, your daughter will be made well, it's the same word as he says to the woman, your faith has made you well. And another uh, way to translate that word, King James Version actually uses whole. So your faith has made you whole. Your daughter will be whole. And remember I said peace in the, in the biblical terms means wholeness. And so we see that Jesus was not too late. And that the situation that seemed dire and and desperate and and really over, you know, the people said, "Don't bother him anymore." She's dead. Jesus still had power over. Him. And so, how do we walk into terrifying situations and have have that peace? Jesus says, "Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be well." And as I was preparing this, I thought. No, do not be afraid. Jesus is here. In whatever situation we face, do not be afraid. Jesus is here. And if he's here, we can go into whatever it is and have peace because he's here with us. And, and he's the greatest resource we can have in any situation, right? So peace is not the absence of conflict or of difficult or dangerous situations. It's faith in the presence and power of God in your situation. There's war and conflict all around us. Somebody said to me this morning, just turn on the news. I was like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> um, peace. You know, we want peace. There's, there's stuff going on all around us. And yet, this, wor this word tells us that we can have peace even in those situations. What is it that allows us to have that peace? Peace that that allows missionaries, like we, we missionaries that we support even here at the church. Um, we've got a couple of missionaries that are, they, they operate, they go back and forth between South Sudan and, Con and the Congo. Two of the worst places on earth. Dangerous places, places where people are being killed, where there's, there's rebels and rebel armies and even peacemakers, just recently 14 of them were killed. Mm -hmm. And yet they stay, and they, they, they don't heed the, the direction of the UN and, and others to say, hey look, if you don't have uh, oppressing me to, to stay here, then get out. And they say, no, we do have oppressing me to stay here. But they can do it with peace because they know that, they're, that, that they are where God has called them to be. <coughs> so what is it that you fear? Is it failure? Is it is it not measuring up? Is it being alone? Is it rejection? Is it loss of a loved one? Is it loss of a relationship? And in what ways do you need to be made whole today? Jesus came, Emmanuel, think of the proclamations of the, the angels, God with us, Emmanuel. Jesus came to be with us. And that scripture that says, unto you a child is born, is still for us today. So Jesus came to give us peace with God and to restore our relationship with God, to, to restore us back into peace with God. He came that we can also have peace on earth. And that concept of peace and wholeness is really not limited to individuals, but uh, encompasses community and relationships as well. So, as I said, the definition of peace includes a state of wholeness and security. Um, and, it, and the second definition says uh, when all essential parts are joined together. And so yesterday I was at a wedding and, and there was, you know, being said to the, the bride and the groom, there's this illustration of marriage being a picture of the church. And um, 
that one, in, in, in a sense, when two come together in marriage, it's like one part of the body has found the other part, the, the complementary part. So um, when we operate with our hands, if you have two hands, they operate together um, much more easily than just one, depending on your task. So um, marriage is like that. You have, you have one person, you have the other, and it's like they found their other part that complements each other. And marriage is an illustration of the church. And so um, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 14, I think I'll um, skip around a little bit in here, but it says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Um, actually, I'll just read. Uh, if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense be? Where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. And so um, the bride and the groom, they were charged, you know, kind of just given this, um, this example and told to each other, listen, a part of you has to die that, that, that you together might live. So to the groom, a part of you has to die so that the bride and groom together can live. To the bride, something in you must die so that together you may live. And if marriage is an illustration of the church, then certainly for, for, for the church, something in us must die that the church may live. Isn't that true? And I mean that not only, I mean that for us here, as, as, as this hope to church, as Second Baptist Church, and I mean it for the church universal, isn't it true that for the church to live, something in us must die? That there will be sacrifices that need to be made. Maybe um, the thing that needs to die is, is certain desires and preferences that we have. Maybe it's certain opinions. Maybe it's the, the, the ways that we think are best that, that not everybody agrees with. Maybe it's our time. Maybe it's our finances. Um, when we sacrifice something in us for the church, that's the way that the church achieves fullness and the way that we have peace with each other. If we always insisted on our way or no way, where would the peace be? So I'll say again that, that world peace is possible because when Jesus came, he came and he brought the opportunity for peace with God to all mankind. And it's possible to have peace in this world even in the midst of chaos and of fears. And it's also possible to have peace with each other for Christ's bride, the church. And so I've asked the question a couple of times, why did the angels say you know, peace and not hope or not you know, other things? But I think that peace is really necessary for those other things. When we're going through Advent, Chrissy preached on hope last week, peace this week, um, Harry's got joy next week, and Steve has uh, love the last week. But how can you have, have peace? Or how can you have hope, rather, if you don't have peace? Imagine trying to hope for something if, you had, if you've got no peace. My, my guess is if you've got no peace, you won't have much hope either. How can you have joy without peace? How can you have even love without peace? So I think, I think maybe part of the, the angel's choice of words there was um, peace was really foundational, and that's what, that's what Christ was bringing. He was bringing peace, um, especially peace with God. So they say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is born. Now, interestingly, Jesus' birth is announced and celebrated with this proclamation of peace. And Jesus himself, some of his final words on, on earth to his disciples were those of peace. So if you look at John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 16, 33. 
I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. God, what assurance that can give us that you have overcome the world. And yet we admit that, that there are things in this world that cause us great fear. And yet so many times you said, and your word says, do not be afraid. Just believe. Just believe it will be well. God, we need the wholeness that you bring to us. Some of us are hurting. All of us are broken. And all of us seek your peace. And so, God, I pray that for anyone who may not have peace with you, first and foremost, that they would, they would make the decision to put their faith in you. That you would bring the peace that comes God, when we put our trust in you and we accept your gift of salvation, thank you, Lord, that you made it not a requirement uh, to complete a to-do list, to do so many good works or so many things. God, but you just required our faith. I pray that that faith will be put in you today. And for the heart that's heavy, the heart that's anxious, the heart that's weighed down with things that would take away our peace. May we not listen to the lies of the enemy, but may we listen to your words, God, and the words of the angels that said, peace on earth. And may we have that peace, now and forever, in Jesus' name.